next approval of another PARP inhibitor probably is going to be Recaparib that has a mm -hmm. PDUFA date of February 23rd. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting now that we have another PARP inhibitor that's been filed to the FDA, Recaparib. Mm -hmm. um, their filing is in the public domain. In fact, their data set was presented at ESMO by Dr. Crystallite. Why don't you share with us what was presented at ESMO and ultimately submitted to the FDA for accelerated approval? So Dr. Crystallite presented uh, at ESMO this year a combination, um, kind of a combination study looking, including patients who were in uh, Aerial 2 Part 1, as well as uh, something called Study 10, which was another Rucaparib study uh, that Clovis carried out. And they particularly were interested in looking at those patients who had a germline or a somatic BRCA mutation and had received um, greater than two lines of prior chemotherapy. And so when they looked at that group, what they found was actually a pretty remarkable outcomes. They had um, a median progression-free survival that was 12 months, uh, and they had an overall response rate that was about 71%. Um, with sort of uh, side effects that were just class effects of, of PARP inhibitors. So uh, again, going back to Dr. Coleman's comment, when you compare that to sort of historical controls, so to speak, it's a fairly remarkable um, progression-free survival, a year, and response um, rate. And, response rate. Yeah. Uh, and so that uh, data is what informed the FDA submission uh, with, as you mentioned, a PDUFA date in February of 17. So we're anticipating another approval in that population. One of the exciting parts about Recaparib is that they have prospectively studied a molecular signature kind of like HRD, mm -hmm. uh, and that was recently published in Aerial 2. I think, Rob, you were a co-author mm -hmm. on that. Tell yep. us about that, uh, what I call the LOH test. W right. What is that? So, um, so homologous recombination deficiency, as we talked about before, can, can arise from a number of different things. So the most obvious um, situation is BRCA mutation and some of the other uh, genes. Interestingly, not all the genes uh, can lead to the same kind of synthetic lethality as we talked about before with giving a PARP inhibitor and the defect. So rather than going through and trying to pick off which genes are ac actually um, so v the vulnerable ones, which is still an ongoing work. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying we're giving up on that. It was easier just to look across all of the genes. The effects. And the, you know, to see whether or not these specific uh, tumors uh, showed up with lots of what we call genomic scar. Yep. Yep. So that they, they, so we know that the, that the machinery is defective. We don't know exactly where it is, yep, but effects. we know it's defective. Mm -hmm. And that's enough. And so, um, so this trial was really set up to, to take that information and interrogate it separate from the BRCA mutations, which we knew from either the somatic or the germline. So, or, or somatic, because the germlines were uh, obviously showed up in the tumor that way. And so that was the, the interesting part of this trial, is that we were moving away from the known into a little bit of the unknown. And, and we'd had a hint of this all during that elaborate work that had been done for the previous six, seven years, where we'd seen responses in patients who did not carry a germline mutation. So we knew there was something going on in the tumor that made these, these particular um, uh, tumors vulnerable. And so the trial, the, the Aerial 2 trial that uh, we had worked on um, was, tr was looking at a, specifically the non-germline patient population. We had genomic scarring and it validated that the recaparib was more effective in those patients with LOH high or genomic scarring. Correct. Yep, okay. So, so, so what, what does telomeric imbalance and, so let's, and, and large scale transitions, what do they add it, it should, versus LOH? Can you look at just LOH or so how do you make so it? So let's set that question up. So yeah. that test is not commercially available. The commercially available test is not only LOH, but as telomeric imbalances and large date transitions, it's a com combination. Right. So now we have two tests. One's commercially available and that one is attached to Neraparib, and we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And as I just said, I used it in my Olaparib patient, and it's now available. Is there a difference between those two HRD molecular tests, Rob? Well, I would say that we don't know. So the LOH that's done in the two tests are done differently. Mm -hmm. um, Gordon Mills at the SGO last year did a very nice analysis of the two assays, but the, but the, but the benchmark was not PARP sensitivity, but platinum sensitivity. And they do line up pretty well, but there are false positives and negatives right. on both of them. So um, I think it's yet to be determined which one is a better test. Um, I think ultimately the work still needs to continue because in, even in Aerial 2, which has a pretty good LOH assay, there was a, there was a person who was a BRCA wild type LOH low 
who had a complete response. Right. So we're still trying to sort out the, uh, the how to do this. 